if you guys haven't noticed, I'm, I'm just going to bring you up to speed for some of you guys that have not been paying attention to, but it's been a very strange season for me. Uh, as God has opened up doors that I did not expect. Can I just say this to you? Uh, so uh, there are some things that I, I know that God is doing in my life and places that he's opened up ministry opportunities for me and places I feel called to, to push for and see happen in my life, uh, places I want to, goals I have set that the kingdom of God has laid out for me. And there are other places that catch me by surprise because of my own mindsets. Uh, how many of you guys understand that no matter where you are at in your walk, that there are mindsets in you that need to change? Uh, there, there is a difference between destructive mindsets and small mindsets. I believe both of them are destructive, but some, some mindsets are purposely for destruction. But did you know that, uh, that you're not only supposed to just stay away from things that are destruction, but you're also supposed to have thoughts that are for construction? Uh, that there are mindsets that will keep you not only uh, uh, keep you in destruction, but there are mindsets that will keep you from constructing what God has called you to. And even though you're not tearing anything down, you're not building anything up. Amen. And so it's necessary that we have the right mindset to not only tear down uh, the things that the enemy has built in our life uh, and not have thoughts that tear down the things that God has done, but also that we construct things in the opposite. A lot of times we're good at tearing things down. Oh, come on. Somebody knows that, right? You have somebody in your life that's really good at just tearing everything down. You're like, I got a great idea. And they're like, mm, nah, I'm about three, 35 seconds, I'm going to tell you exactly how not great it is. You have some people in your life like that? If some of you are like, no, I can't think of anyone, it's probably you. <laughs> See how I just tore that down right there? You had this great image of yourself and it just got ripped down. You saw, okay, so a good example. That was a sermon illustration, didn't mean it. All right. If you're wondering, it might be you. <laughs> so, we're good at tearing things down and we're not always great at building things up. Although it seems that we're really good at building up the wrong things sometimes. Uh, we get caught in mindsets that bring destruction and build destructive uh, empires in our mindsets. The enemy is really good at convincing us to be builders for him. And so we want to be loosed from that. And, and so I had a revelation that I wanted to share with you this morning. As I was praying, I caught a revelation. So what I'm going to say isn't necessarily a brand new thing that I've never said before. Some of it may be a repeat for you, but there's a revelation in it that I caught, not just the how, but the why. And so I asked myself a simple question. I said, Lord, why has there been such an uptick in deliverance? Uh, and if you're, you're, you're new, you don't understand there, over the last several years, uh, it seems that when we begin to pray in a service, uh, there is more deliverance that happens. Deliverance meaning people that are in bondage uh, uh, to addiction or demonic bondage, quite literal demonic bondage, or maybe just in bondage to addiction or sin. There seems to be an uptick in the increase of deliverance that's happened. People being set free uh, from, the, uh, from, from demonization. I remember the first time I went to Africa and I saw people on the regular manifesting demons. And I was like, well, this is, this is new. This is new. And so I saw it a lot over there. I did not see it a lot over here. Um, I don't know, but the question was kind of like this. Let me give you a way that it was kind of playing in my mind. Um, was if anybody in here has ever seen the movie Ghostbusters, uh, there's a scene in there where they're, where they're catching all these ghosts and, and I'm not suggesting that the movie, I'm just saying that there's this moment in there is just that they're catching all these ghosts and the one asks the other one, like, why, why is there such an increase of this happening? Like, why are there so many paranormal things happening? Why is there so many ghosts? Like, it seems like something is going on. And so I'm like, Lord, why is there so many uh, demonic things in the, in the realm of reality? Why is there so many demonic things? It seems like something is going on. So I had that image of like, you know, there's something being planned and plotted behind the scenes. And as soon as I asked the Lord, Lord, why is there such an increase and every time a service happens where I pray and someone is delivered. Why is that happening? And God instantly gave me an answer. 
And it was like a truth bomb just went off and a revelation hit me. Uh, and so I'm going to share that with you this morning. Amen. Why, what, what the increase is for. It's not just sudden. I don't know if you were uh, raised in the era that I was raised. I've been in church a long time since I was, uh, since I was 16 years old. So at least 10 years, I don't appreciate the laughter. That's hurtful. So I said, at least no lie, at least. Okay. So, um, dang. It's cold. It's been 30 years. It's exactly 30 years. That's right. So this is my 30-year birthday. Amen. This year is my 30-year birthday. Um, so, amen. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize it till someone just said it. That's right. It's 30 years. All right. Amen. So, but I, I realized, that, like, Lord, I realized when I went to Africa, I saw that for the first time. And I'm like, yeah, there's demons in Africa. I was like, I don't know if you're aware. But I lived under the narrative of the church before. It's like, there's no demons. There's no demons in America. They're all over in foreign countries like Africa. There's no demons. Demons don't make it over to America. Yeah, you know. There's no open spiritual borders. Like, there's none of that stuff. Like, like there, you, you can't get demons over here, and and, and you know, like the, the narrative. Like I don't know if you've ever been to the doctor and you've been to a foreign country, and you're like, uh, uh, or you go to the doctor and you're like, could this be a parasite? And they're like, have you been to a foreign country? And you're like, no. And then like, then it can't be a parasite. Apparently, in America, there's no demons and there's no parasites. Did you know that? Right? There's no parasite. If, if you don't go to a foreign country, they don't even want to check for that. And I'm like, that's funny. And, and I understood that wasn't true. I knew there was demons here. And I also knew there was parasites. Otherwise, why do we have dewormer for our animals? Like, how do they get the parasite? There's none? Yeah, there seems to be quite a bit, right? Like, so, so I'm, I'm wondering, I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. I know there's demons, but I don't see the manifestation of the demonic here. And I saw it a lot in other countries when I went, but I didn't see it here. But that has shifted over the last several years. Amen? If you've been here for any length of time or maybe another church culture, that has changed. Something has radically changed. And I'm like, Lord, why is it changing? And God gave me two things that caused it to change. Are you ready for it? I'm going to tell you in a little bit. I know. I've got to keep you on the edge of your seat. This is why they're like, I can't leave because you haven't told me yet. So it does go long. <laughs> tell me so I can decide what part I want to leave. Okay, you're just going to give more information on it. I can go now. No, I'm going to tell you. All right, so what I realize is that we're in this season that's so interesting to me. Uh, we're, in a, we're, we're in an election season right now, if you didn't know. Um, I am not a political pastor, uh, but suddenly I found myself this week in places I haven't asked for. Uh, I, and I have been very adamant about, I don't talk politics from the pulpit. I represent the kingdom of God and him alone. Uh, and, and that is very important to me that I am a pastor who represents the kingdom of God, not a man-made government and not a side. Uh, and so I, I'm on God's side and that's been very important to me. And all of a sudden God has opened up this realm. I'm a person. I have a personal opinion. Okay. But when I'm in the pulpit, I'm a priest and it's different. It's different than my personal opinion. And so I navigate that carefully. Uh, and I don't want to ever overstep that place uh, of, of becoming a, a politicized church or a politicized pulpit. I won't do that. But all of a sudden, I found myself in places I haven't asked for that I've actually resisted and had opportunities for in the past. But just the other day, uh, I got invited to go up to a pastor's meeting uh, that was about building the kingdom of God through uh, taking back the mountain of government. And I'm good with that. And so I understand we need godly representation. God gave me a word in 22 that told me that the, the days of the corrupt kingmakers and kings are over, that God is exposing both in, in the church or in uh, the, the, the uh, with God's, it'll start in God's house and then go to government's house. And God said there would be exposure and the days of the corrupt kingmakers are over and God is raising up the hidden ones in this season. And so I knew I was going to see that in God's house and I knew I'd see that in government. So that's not, I'm not talking politics. I'm talking about kingdom, the kingdom of God advancing over the kingdoms of this world. We are called to, to step in and occupy. 
The kingdoms of this world belong to God. So there should be, without politics, there should be, you should see the kingdom of God begin to make its way into government places and take over. It is not a hostile takeover. It's a loving takeover. It's a takeover of love. It's an overwhelming love that begins to change a nation into a godly nation. And so government leaders should change as well. That should be a part of it. We're still not talking politics, but there is a dangerous precipice that steps over into the wrong place. And I think I have an understanding of why it happens. So a couple of days ago, I went to this event and I got seated uh, with uh, U.S. Uh, congressman uh, candidate, our next U.S. congressman, Paul Bondar, invited me and his team invited me and they sat me at his table uh, with our other U.S. congressman, uh, uh, Congressman Hearn from District 1 and, and with the, the leader of the event. And so I, I looked around and I realized I'm sitting at the influential table. This is a big room with hundreds of people at this dinner and, and they've seated me in the place that everyone wants to come over to to say hello. Uh, and I'm in a place of that. And I just had this overwhelming sense from God, I don't want to be here right now. I want you to understand this. I, I was overwhelmed and gra in, in gratitude going, God, you've given me favor. I, don't, I, I didn't ask for this. It wasn't seeking it. But you've given me favor. And I just thought, oh, this would be a great time to go lie down at the altar and just praise him. I kind of don't want to be here. And God said, that's why I've put you here. I put you here because you're a man like David who would rather be in the temple than at their table. And I realized that when we have the heart to be in the temple, that God will put us in places and tables that we never thought we would sit at. Because our heart's desire is to sit at his table in the presence of the enemies. Uh, but when we're unwilling to sit at his, his, sit in his temple, we'll never quite make it to his table. And if we never quite make it to his table, we certainly will not know how to handle the table uh, that may have enemies at it. And so it's very important. So I'm sitting there and I'm grateful for that. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to overstep my place. I don't want to. And it wasn't just that I got seated somewhere. I mean, uh, there has been, uh, 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 God has been giving me favor in those places to be able to speak into leaders in this season. So on, on Saturday, just to let you know, on Saturday, I gave my first political speech ever. Yeah, that happened. I got a phone call at 1245 and, and uh, they were like, hey, Paul can't be, can you go to this church and there's a rally and will you speak for Paul? And I'm like, ooh. Oh, you know, I had told them, however I can pray for you, however I can help. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go do it. So I went and do it. I prayed and I asked the Lord, I went and did it. And so I got up and I gave my first political speech. Would you like to know what I said? Anybody? Some of you are like, no, no, that's not okay. This was my political speech. I prayed for Paul Bondar at dinner and he got healed of a, of, of a hip problem he had since birth. Amen. And then I said, I had a word in 22 that God was removing the corrupt kingmakers. And I published that in Charisma Magazine. And God is doing that in this season. Amen. And then I said, uh, Paul came to my church and, and we prayed over him. And, and I believe he's a man of God. Amen. He had a radical encounter with the Lord. I said, I don't know anything about this political stuff. I don't even know his platform. But I know that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. And I know that he'll follow God. Because, and, and how do I know that he's the right one to pick? Because God gave me a word for him. I asked the Lord before I knew he was running. I said, Lord, if he's supposed to run, he didn't know if he should run. And, he, uh, and his campaign manager wanted a word from the Lord. Do you have a word uh, about whether this man should run? He's debating about running. And, and I feel like he's supposed to, but I need some help. And I said, has he filed yet? No. Okay, so I can't look him up. No, and you haven't told me his name. Don't. So don't tell me anything about this man. If he's supposed to run, God will give me a detail like a family member's name or his birthday. Okay. So I messaged him back. I messaged him back his birthday. And he took that to him and Paul said, that's my birthday. And he knew he's supposed to run. And so I told them this. And then I said, so I have nothing bad to say about the uh, opponent. I said a couple other small things, but I said, I'm not here 
to give a political speech. I'm just here to speak to the character and nature that I've seen out of this person. So if you're looking for someone whose character is true and his words are true uh, and you can trust his character, uh, then that's him. And that was my political speech. I gave a sermon. But I'm like, God, man, I don't, I don't want to get involved in this stuff. Like, this is not what I'm called to. And, and I understand there's a, a melding of the kingdom. Like, I get that. And I, I don't want to ever be seen that way. And, and, and I understand that there's something that's gripping our nation. And that we have, because I'll tell you, at the same time, like, that was exciting. I went inside the church. And I, I don't mean to shame any church, but I can't, I can't shake loose of this. I can't shake loose of it. So forgive me. So I'm telling you as I'm stepping into political influence or uh, leader influence, right? Samuel. Uh, raised up David to be king. Samuel appointed Saul to be king. He spoke into leaders' lives. Esther saved the nation of Israel because she spoke into the king's life. We need godly people. We need priests and Christians, prophets, leaders to speak into our national leaders, to speak into government leaders. Government leaders need their ears and they need our mouths. So it's important that we are in those places, but it's important not to cross those lines. So I went to the church, and, and, and as I was there and, and doing what I was asked to do, I peeked into the sanctuary. And, and I asked the little kid, because I saw it, and I was a little confused. I'm like, oh, that, that's interesting. They, they, they were really going all out for today. Because I noticed that across the entire back wall of the, of the stage was a giant American flag. Like, it covered the whole backstage of the, of the sanctuary uh, behind the pulpit. It was a giant American flag. And I said, oh, were they going to do something inside? Because they were doing it outside. And maybe they, they, they were doing it inside. And I said, is that flag always up uh, uh, in, the, in the sanctuary? Is that the main sanctuary? Yes. Is that flag always up? And the little kid, oh, yeah, every Sunday. That flag's, yeah, that flag's always there. And my heart got grieved. Can I just say that? My heart was completely grieved seeing that. Uh, let me tell you why. If I went to a church in China... And what was behind the pulpit was a Chinese flag. I would be grieved, wouldn't you? That the only thing I see is that they're, the only thing that's visible to me is the government of this world, not the government of that. And as much as we want to be patriots, I am the kingdom of God in this pulpit. This place, this altar, and this platform is to elevate the king of kings, not a kingdom of man. We are allowed to be citizens. We are allowed to be patriotic. It does not belong on this stage. If you disagree with me, that's okay. I will not change that position. We keep holy what's holy. And we chase after God. But we understand that our government is founded by God, not our government is God. And so it will not be back here as though the first thing you see when you walk in is that we are worshiping a government. This is the word of God. This is the inspired word of God. And I believe that our founding fathers were inspired by God. You know, there's a great story that I heard about our founding fathers being inspired by God. You know, they prayed during the Civil War, uh, during the Revolutionary War, excuse me. They prayed all the time for divine providence to come and God to lead them in great ways. But when they went to write the Constitution, they struggled to write the Constitution. In fact, for several weeks, like two or three weeks, they couldn't come up with anything. They couldn't get anywhere, just no progress. And they were getting frustrated. One of the founding fathers brought up the fact, they said, you know, during the Revolutionary War, we prayed for the providence of God all the time. Uh, by the way, it was one of the founding fathers. I can't remember who, but it was one of the founding fathers who was considered a deist that didn't believe in God really. And he said, we prayed all the time. And the hand of God was there for us. And he goes, but yet as we've been trying to form this country and write a document, we haven't prayed once. And so they all took several days. They left and they fasted and they prayed. And then they came back together and wrote the Constitution. So I believe God's hand is in that document. I believe that God's hand is there. But this is the inspired word. Do we understand? And so what I realized is, is that what is it that gravitates us towards those things where we step further than we should? Uh, and I realized something is, something big that happens, the reason why we push into that stuff is that there is a fundamental flaw in our faith. There is a fundamental flaw in our faith that says we don't actually completely trust God to resolve the situation. 
We haven't completely trusted God to lead us. And so what we've done is we put our trust in a government instead of God alone. Now, I trust God to lead godly men and women in our government. I trust God that he's raising up hidden ones in this season. And so I'm not absent of those two things. What happens is I trust God as he leads others. You trust me as I lead you. uh, And I trust that God is raising those up. And I'm proactive in my trust. Faith without what? Works is dead. So there are works that demonstrate my trust, my faith that God is moving. And so I'm active in my faith. I'm not, I don't sit back and go, God, you'll take care of it. That's a mistake. I'm active in my faith, but my faith, the works that come with it show and demonstrate my trust. The problem is, is when we respond, not out of trust of God, but fear of the enemy. So we are responding, uh, response is the wrong word. We are reacting to the enemy. To out of fear of the enemy rather than in response to the kingdom of God. Because we trust God, we are active, not because we are afraid of the enemy. Do you understand the difference there? One is a, a fear response or a trauma response. The other one is boldness that God has given us to advance the kingdom of God into all the earth. And so I've recognized that there are some ways that the enemy gets a hold of you and why we're seeing an increase in the demonic. But we have to understand first before I tell you what happened, how the enemy grabs hold of you and why we're seeing more people demonized than ever before. The Bible says this in Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. I've talked about this before. That word foothold in the Greek means quite literally place. So it means it's just, it's place. It means place. Foothold is a, is a fancy translation. It has nothing to do with the actual word. Uh, while you are still angry and do not give the devil a place. Uh, that word, 94 out of 95 times, it's listed 95 times in the Bible, and 94 out of 95 times, it's definitively a physical location. There's only one time in the Bible that you could bring up a debate of whether or not it was physical or a spiritual location. But every 94 times, it's definitively, why? Because I read every one of them. Every single time, it is definitively a physical location it is taught they went to the place where the pool was they went to the place where they worship they they were going to the place you so it was always a place that they were going to every single time so it says don't give the devil a physical location well there's a secret there in ephesians how did he get the physical physical location in your anger do not sin don't let the sun go down while you are still angry Anger is a door for the devil. It opens you up. So there are people that are active in their faith in in this season right now, but they're not active because they're saying, they don't have a word from the Lord going, God wants to put godly leaders in our nation, and so I'm going to actively support it. Hoorah, I'm excited. I love what God is doing. They are doing it out of anger. And so while they are doing the morally right thing, they are doing it out of the wrong heart. And here's the truth. You can be demonized doing good things. Eve saw that the fruit was good. It wasn't evil. She saw that it was good and it would give her wisdom. It wasn't that it was giving bad things. So the enemy can use good things to grab you. Some of you are catching that right now. So anger is an open door. So I'm like, Lord, what are the open doors? How are, we, how, how are you getting in there? So there, there are seasons where it's like the enemy has overshowed his hand. Now I'm mad. You need to be real careful. When I teach about how to bring a greater level of deliverance, one of the biggest revelations that I give is very simply this. Stop hating demons more than you love the person that's demonized. If you hate the demon more than you love the person, you will get the demon out, but you will traumatize the person in the process because you're more interested in screaming and yelling and beating and stabbing and slashing demons, and that person is in a nightmare, and you don't care at all. 
You, you, you want to uh, make a mockery of the demon. Well, Jesus made a mockery. You want to make a mockery of the demon. You don't realize it's through a person and they're being humiliated to the point of PTSD. Like that's what happens because you hate something more than you love. And so what happens is, is you give yourself an anger. I got some righteous anger. You better be real careful with the word righteous anger. Because I believe there are a lot of people that make the excuse that their anger is righteous anger and they don't realize that they've opened a door to the enemy. The enemy will creep in anywhere he can and he'll make you think it's righteous. I remember the Pharisees thought they were pretty righteously angry towards Jesus and him breaking the law. They were righteously angry and it said that the devil was in them. Do you know that? The devil was in them. And I can tell you this, as many deliverances as I've done, um, a religious spirit seems to be the one that um, has the most hold. In fact, I'll say this way. Uh, there is a difference between a demon occupying territory and being married to the person, to where they become one. What you don't see is Jesus cast out religious spirits. He rebukes them and calls them dead already. He's not trying to cast out a demon to find the living person. He says they've already died because they've married themselves to that. They've become one flesh with that thing. There's a difference. So we have to be real careful not to do that. But we give in to anger, and anger grabs a hold of us. So we have to begin to tear down those things. So there are two things that cause, that I think that are the biggest things in this season that I've seen that have caused demonization to happen at a greater scale. And I'm going to give you the revelation in a minute about like how it happened. But the second one is fear. Second Timothy 1 7. We all know this one. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. So we have to renew our mind. We have to have a sound mind. Otherwise, we've given ourselves into a spirit of fear. Uh, what does it say? Fear is a what? Spirit. It is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. Second Corinthians 10 5 says this. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So I want you to understand that fear is a spirit. So when we have a thought that comes through our mind as fear, that is a spirit of thought. It is a spirit. And it says this, we demolish arguments. You are called to tear down those thoughts to demolish the thoughts and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every, captive every thought that may get obedient to Christ. So if we are called to take thoughts captive, what are thoughts? What, what are negative thoughts? Fearful thoughts, angry thoughts, what are they? They're enemies. They're literal soldiers that are meant to be taken captive. They are spirits, not just thoughts, not just your own self. There's sometimes you have a thought and you think there's something wrong with me that my mindset is not right. And we do not realize that some of those are a spirit and you are called to put them in prison. Not entertain them, execute them. Demolish every stronghold. Demolish every thought. Tear them down. They are enemies and they are places. So that means that how does the enemy gain hold of us? Corrupted thought that's entertained opens the door to demonization. When you have a corrupted thought that you don't demolish, but you desire. See, you're beating yourself up because a thought of desire came. The thought of desire is, a, is an enemy combatant. There's not a problem because you had a thought of desire. It's when you desire the thought that there's a problem. When the thought comes and you start going, yeah, sounds pretty good. You've now come into agreement with that thought. And so a spirit of fear. And so when there is a negative response, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is holy, think on these things. God gave us a perspective of what we are to think on so that we don't dwell on negative things. So when we come into uh, anger, fear, humiliation, insecurity, any, any tight pride, all these negative thoughts are the opposite. They are usually spirits trying to gain access to you. I'm going to prove it in just a second. Okay, I'm going to show you in the scripture, I'm going to sh and then I'm going to show you in the nation. 1 John 4.18 says this. Before I read this, how many of you guys own a faith over fear shirt? Anybody? One, just one? Okay, two, anybody else? 
some people online? On, okay, so uh, that's theologically incorrect. I don't mean to ruin, ruin your wardrobe, but you're okay, okay? But it's, it's bad theology, faith over fear. That's, that's, the Bible nowhere says that if you have fear, it's because you have a lack of faith, that, that, that they're not in contrast to each other and they have nothing to do with it. The enemy would love to convince you of that because if you never understand what tool you're supposed to use, you'll never get free. You'll never build, you'll never tear down, you'll never build what you're called to if you don't know the right tool, amen? There is nothing more frustrating. I don't know if there's any men in the room like me, but there's nothing more frustrating. You wanna see me angry? Just let me not be able to find the one tool that will fix the one thing in 15 seconds, and it takes me 30 minutes to find the tool to fix something that takes 15 seconds. And, and I'm like... Who moved my tool? And 90% of the time it was me, but it doesn't make me any less. I could be just as mad at me. <laughs> what is wrong? I told you to put that tool back. <laughs> it doesn't have to be at anybody else. Rachel has learned a long time. I don't get mad about much. There's not much that I, you'll see me going. <laughs> but if he's like, he's looking for a tool. Everyone just be like, I'm going to leave him alone. Go to the other one. Hey, pastor, not now, not now. He's looking for a tool. Don't do it. So Rachel used to be like, well, I didn't touch the tool. And she would start like having a conversation with me. And so I'm all frustrated, right? So what happens at my frustration? You know, I'm like, turn. I'm like Cyclops from X-Men. You know, I'm like, ah, I burned her, right? Like, I got just I, wherever it's pointed. Like, don't point it at you. You see this? Don't, don't be like, hey, I'm over here, by the way. <laughs> like, don't point. So, like, she figured out, like, you know, I, I don't think he's upset at me. I think he's just frustrated. And, and, and so she would just, like, so over the years, she would learn, and it would actually calm me down. I, I'd be like, I can't find the thing. And, 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 she, and she would just quietly get up, put her stuff down, and she'd go over, and I'd see her, like, looking, you know, and I'm like, oh. And she's just like, don't look at him. Just go find it. I'm just going to help. And I'm like, I never asked you to find it. She's like, I could help. And I'm like, oh. And it would like, I'm like, oh. She is quietly getting up so I don't point at her. I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm getting all frustrated. I've gotten much better over the years. You know, but that was that one, that one thing. Like, everyone's got their one thing. I used to, I used to be really bad at Walmart rage. I didn't, I don't have... Uh, <laughs> I don't have car rage at all. Like, I don't have car rage. Like, I'm one of those, I'm like, what is wrong with you? So how's your day been? Like, I get, you know, I get three-second road rage. Like, that's all I get. Like, so I'm so totally okay. But Walmart rage. You park your, you man, you, oh, you park your cart on one side and then stand between you and the cart on the, and looking at the stuff on the other side and your cart's blocking one way and you're blocking the other way. Whew. That was the one place where like, Jesus, I need you to take the wheel of their car and push it on to them. Oh, no, no, Lord. No, Lord. No, Lord. Lord, just, just. So I was so bad. Like, I have, I want you to understand. I'm telling on myself from years ago, but not now, okay? I was a work in progress. I have finally fixed this one, but I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so um, I, would, I was the guy who was like, I'd see that and I, and I would literally walk up and stand there and they, they would be oblivious, right? I, I don't think people are always trying to be rude. I just think they're unaware there are other people alive on the earth. <laughs> I think some people just think they're all alone, right? So I'm like, you know, there's other humans alive. <clears throat> I don't know if you're aware of that. And so... Um, I would literally be the guy that would walk up and be like, oh, okay, not like anybody else wants to get through this aisle. I would say it, not think it. I did not take that thought captive at all. I loosed it. Some of you are like, I said it. I did too. I did too, right? And, and I would say it. And one time, somebody say one time. It was more than one time. It's true. It t I got a thick head. It took me a few times. But um, this is when we were Mustang, and the Walmart Mustang was, like, just right next to our church, like, within walking distance almost. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd be there, and I'm like, not like anybody else wants to walk through. And the person turned around, and it was one of our church members. And they looked at me like, you know, like this person is being completely rude. And I saw them, and I knew what I had done. And I instantly understood that the sun had gone down on my wrath. 
And I was like, oh, be angry and do not sin. Like, okay, ah, uh, and luckily I am quick with it, okay? And they turned around and they looked at me and I'm like, oh, my dear, Lord, help me. I say, but it, the Bible says don't worry in that day when you face trial, right? Because that person is definitely judging me right now, that God will give you something to say in that moment. And thank the Lord he bailed me out while I learned my lesson because I instantly just looked at him and said, I got ya. <laughs> and they went, Oh, pastor, you got me. I'm like, dang. And I was like, ha, how are you? Scared you. I got to repent. I got to change. I got to get this fixed. So like, praise God. I testify. I have fixed that. No more Walmart rage. I go into Walmart and I'm like, pray, I pray in tongues the whole way. It was, be shut up. 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 Lord, help me. So I would be angry and I would, but, but I, I realized like we're all prone to that. We don't take our thoughts captive and we need to learn to take our thoughts captive and put them in submission. It is a lifelong journey in several areas. So not all of us are there yet in one area or another. And you say, well, I don't have no Walmart rage, but you have other places that frustrate you and make you angry and you give into those thoughts. You entertain those thoughts and they feel, why is it, why do you think it is that when you, when you have an angry thought or you're frustrated, you actually feel powerful for a moment. For a moment, you're like, I don't want to stop being angry. I don't want to forgive them. You ever had somebody repent to you and you're like, dang it. I wasn't done being mad. I was enjoying being angry. And now you've repented and I have to forgive you and I'm not ready to. There is something that makes you feel like, let me say it clearly. You are not empowered by your anger, but there is something in you that you start to feel empowered by your anger. That's a spirit in you. That's a spirit that is giving you a false sense of power by being angry. But fear is the exact same thing. Now, while you don't feel powerful in fear, you feel like you're trying to recapture your power. You feel like you're trying to reclaim power. So you feel like some power has been stolen. And so you're searching out. The enemy's wise. He knows. He understands. So we demolish those arguments and we take them captive because they're prisoners. They don't belong to us. So 1 John 4, 18 says this. It gives us the idea of what, it's not faith over fear. So I'm not going, Lord, I'm afraid, so I must have no faith in you. The Bible doesn't say that. It says this. There is no fear in faith. No, there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. So there, fear is a spirit. And it turns out that perfect love casts it out. So fear can be a spirit that is cast out. That's what the word says. It gets cast out. But it doesn't get cast out by faith. It gets cast out by love. Jesus didn't heal because of faith. He healed because of love. It says he had compassion on them, so he healed them. Faith is a component of that, that exercise. But the, the umbrella, the overlying principle is because he loved, he did. And so it is perfect love that casts out fear, not faith. You need to add faith as a tool to your arsenal, but, it is, but without love, you've, you've taken away the greatest tool that you have, period. Okay? So I want you to catch this because I feel like in this season, this is relevant to us. I think what happens is we get so caught up in what we hate that we forget what we love. The enemy doesn't have to get us riled up to put in godly government leaders. He just, got, he just has to get us to hate the ungodly ones. He doesn't, get, he doesn't have to get us to love a political party. He just got, has to get us to hate one. And we're so wrapped up in our hate that we don't realize that as we're hating the enemy, he's getting access to us. Anybody ever seen Star Wars, right? It's like, give in to your hate. The emperor telling, telling Luke, give in to your hate. And he's like, oh, Luke wants to kill the emperor. And by, killing the, by trying to kill the emperor, he's actually giving in to the emperor. He's becoming a part of the team. And there is a giving in to hate. And I feel like that was profound. I'm giving a lot of movie references today. So, but by doing that, by giving in to hate, yeah, spoiler from 1978, uh, <laughs> giving in to hate, he's actually going to the dark side. And so there is, uh, when, when we hate something more than we love the Lord, more than we love his precepts, I love your law, O oh Lord. 
I love your precepts. I love your presence. When it's not about loving his presence or loving the son and daughter we're in front of or loving that he set them free, but rather hating something, we actually open a door. So it says there is no love in fear, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Let me say this. Where... Wherever your fear is, so is your faith. Whatever you fear, you worship. Can I say that? Because you believe it's the most powerful thing in front of you. If you think that God is bigger, then you won't fear the enemy. But if you're afraid of the enemy, you think he's more powerful. He's the most powerful. I, I use this illustration that when I go places and, and, and big country, Dean's standing right next to me, right? And someone comes up and talks smack. I'm like, <laughs> You should probably stop right now. Like, I, I, I'm walking around, and his, you know, he, he's like, I'm a, I'll keep you safe, sir. And I'm like, I bet, I bet you will. But it's like, I, someone comes up and is like, ah, oh, you know, like when I go to a foreign country, someone comes up and gets in my face or is approaching me. I, I have the biggest guy on my team. I'm not really afraid of you. Like, I, I'm not afraid for myself, but I also know who's on my team. And so it's like, ha, 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 you have made a really big mistake right now. Uh, and so I know who's on my team. And so whatever, so I believe I have the best team. So when you're, you're serving the Lord, if, you, if you're more afraid of what the enemy is doing in your life, then, then uh, you have fear of the Lord. You have put your faith in the wrong place. That's where they're opposites, okay, is that you're putting your faith in the enemy's ability to destroy you. And we have to be careful of that. And so whatever you fear, you, you'll worship, because your mindset will go to that. Your thoughts will go to that. And here's the truth. Whatever you are, here, every one of you know this. When you are angry or you are afraid, and there's other things. There's pride and there's lusts and all that stuff. But I think even more than those, I think. Each person may be a little differently, but I would think that what, the one that consumes our thoughts the most is when we are angry at something or we are afraid of something. We will dwell on those things the most. They have the most ability to occupy our mindsets. That's where we'll go. I'm so angry. There's been times where I was so upset, someone hurt me, that the first thing on my mind before I even realized I was awake was that situation. Right? And fear will do the same thing. It'll paralyze you into that thought. And so those two demonic forces coupled together are probably the most dangerous thing to the kingdom of God right now. They're the most dangerous thing to the people of God is whenever you can bring a season where fear and anger are teamed up together in a situation that causes people to just dwell in fear and anger. Fear and anger. When they're both coupled together, they are dangerous multipliers. They're not plus. They multiply. Psalms 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me. Someone say delivered. Delivered me from all my fears. So you can be delivered from a spirit of fear. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of man lays a snare. So when you are afraid in a season of man, of the government, of other people, when there is fear in you of man, it is actually a trap the enemy has set for you. It will lay a snare for him. But what I find interesting about all these is there's always a hope that's given in each one of these scriptures. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And so God says this, if you fear, look at the opposite. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is the safe. So if you are afraid of man, you are not really trusting in the Lord, are you? So it gives us a direct, if you'll just trust me, you won't be afraid of them. Shalom, I leave you. My shalom, peace. And the reason why I read it in the, the TLV version, shalom I leave you, my shalom I give you. You've heard that before. My peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Uh, but it says this, and that's why shalom's more powerful. It says shalom I leave you, my shalom I give you, but not as the world gives. The word peace implies surrender. The only time two warring nations ever have peace is when one warring nation admits defeat and surrenders and is at the mercy, mercy or slavery of the other nation. The other nation they've surrendered to now sets the term of that surrender, right? In ancient times, or, you know, 
100 and something years ago, passed about 200 plus years ago, when you surrendered to a nation, many times it meant being enslaved to that nation. Okay, and so that is, that's the world's version of peace. But this is shalom, not as the world gives, but not let your heart be troubled or afraid. So peace becomes a weapon to not allow your heart to be troubled or afraid. Love is the umbrella, and God gives us all these ways that we can increase our ability through trust and through having the peace of God, that we don't have to be troubled in the storms. I'm not afraid, but I carry the shalom of God. I don't need to be afraid. Because I love God, I have his shalom in me. Because I love people, I have his shalom in me for them as well. Psalms 103.17. See, I'm just running through these scriptures so we know that there's meat in this. Psalms 103.17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. How do we get more love in us? Make sure that we haven't lost fear in the one we are supposed to fear, God. Not be afraid of God. There is a difference between being afraid of the world and fearing God. You cannot... Lose the fear of God. Do you realize it's built in us that we will love something and be afraid of something? That's how it works because they're opposites. We will love something and be afraid of something. And so either you love God and are afraid of him or you love the world and you're afraid of the world. The same world that people want to chase after is the same world they're terrified of. The same world that brings all the desires of your heart is the same world you're afraid of as you chase those desires. You want them all and you're afraid they'll be taken from you. Like you can lust and fear the same thing. And so you can love God and fear him at the same time, recognizing that he's big and he wants you to follow his precepts. And here's the interesting thing about all these things is that these are all commands. He gave Joshua a command and said, do not be afraid. I command you to be strong and courageous. It doesn't mean he's not facing a situation where there's fear in there. He's just overcoming it. He is demolishing the fear. He is taking fear captive. It's not that there's no fear in facing an enemy. It's that he refuses to allow fear a foothold, a place in him. It may be present, but it doesn't have a place. And so that's the difference is that God is saying, I'm going to tear that down instead of you giving in to fear. Courage, courage, excuse me, courage is when you resist fear that's there and press through and move forward anyways. Courage is not when you don't have fear. It's when you don't let fear have a place. When you take it captive and you say, it's, it's, I'm, this, is, this is scary, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to do it. I tell people, people are like, how do you pray for people? You're so bold and like you're not afraid of anything. Yes, I am. Absolutely. I just do it anyways. I don't care. I don't let fear have a place. I don't let fear dictate the outcome. I don't let fear determine what I do. Fear does not direct me in any way. It is not my compass in any way, shape, or form. I tear it down every opportunity it has to poke its ugly head up. So be strong and courageous. And so some of you aren't aware of how much God, I, but I command you. And so what happens is when we live a life of fear or anger, we are literally... It's sin. Can I say that? It is sin. Why, why would you say it's sin, Pastor Ed? Because God has commanded us not to, and we are. That is a direct violation of a command he gave us, which means we're in disobedience to a command, which in itself is sin. To be a coward is to be in sin, perpetually. Perpetually. I can prove that. In the book of Revelation... It tells us who goes into the lake of fire. It says liars go in there last. It talks about adulterers going in there, murderers, right? The fornicators, they go into the lake of fire, those sinners. Sinners going, just lying to everybody, go to the lake of fire. That is not a nice weekend lake retreat, okay? They're going in the lake of fire. But do you know the first one into the lake of fire? You know who, what it says? Cowards. Cowards are the very first one. There are people who have allowed their lives to be a stronghold for the enemy, who have let the enemy take them over like a parasite and demonize them. They, they, they're zombies. They live for the enemy. 
that carry the enemy in them because they are perpetually in fear. And so they, they're cowards. They give in to fear constantly. I, when I read that, I'm like, that's really harsh, man. Like, he's just afraid. And, and I was like, God is trying. There, there's something to this. God is not a mean God. He, he's not trying to be harsh on us to be harsh. He has mercy and goodness. So there must be a revelation in here that we don't understand of how dangerous fear is that he would throw the cowards in there so that we must resist that and put us in right standing with what he's given us a weapon and so many weapons against fear. And anger, there must be something. It doesn't say the angry get thrown in there, but the fearful get thrown in there. The ones that live by that fear. And, and it's like God is trying to keep us from something that is destructive, that not just is destructive for us, but actually is destructive for everyone that's around us because of our fear. Ask any soldier what will get you killed faster. Lack of skill or, or a, 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 a fearful soldier. A soldier that panics in the moment, right? That gives into fear and freezes. Right? Yeah, that it, right, that it's dangerous to everyone around. All right, you ready for it? Here it is. So I was like, Lord, why do we see the uptick of the demonization? What, what happened? What opened the door? Where, where did this come from? That so many people are demonized. The spirit of fear is on them and the spirit of anger is in them. And demonization is every time I pray, demons are manifest in the world. And the Lord spoke. And I said, Lord, when did this happen? I said, over, when, you know, back when I first was doing ministry, we never saw people manifest. And it's not that we didn't see healings or signs and wonders or prophecy. We were seeing the gifts. It wasn't that we were a dead cessationist church that didn't believe in that. So where, why did it all of a sudden, every time I turn around, suddenly, you know, like five will goes to America. You guys remember that? No cats in America. There are no demons in America, right? It's like, no, what brought them in? How did it happen? And God said, when the whole nation gave in to the spirit of fear during the pandemic, our entire nation was gripped with fear. That is not a political statement I just made. I did not tell you whether the pandemic was true or false. I did not tell you whether it was good or bad. I, I don't care. In fact, what the Lord said to me has no bearing on whether or not there was a real pandemic, a fake pandemic. None of that matters to what happened. The reality is, is all the enemy needs is for something true or false to bring fear and open a door so you can be demonized. And because fear gripped our nation. And for those of you that say, well, I wasn't afraid. No, but you got angry. For you that didn't get afraid, you were angry at all the people that were afraid. Tell me I'm lying. See, it's hitting you right now. You're like, my mind is blown. He just, he's right. These people walking around in fear. And the other people going, you're not afraid. You're going to kill me. Fear gripped people. It divided people. And they got angry. They got fearful. They were angry at their government. They were afraid. They were terrified. And the enemy used all of it to bring the level of demonization we have not seen in our lifetime into America. So I asked the Lord another question. I said, okay, Lord, this is not the first time that we've had things that brought fear over a nation. We have wars and We've had other pandemics and things like that over the years, over the course of history and our nation. Uh, uh, what's the difference between what has happened now and what happened maybe, uh, you know, Vietnam or, or other pandemics or other things that have happened? And you know, how come this one has brought that level uh, that's different where every time I pray, I see it. And the Lord said this to me. He said, all of them brought that level. And I said, well, why am I seeing it now? We didn't see it then. He says, well, you preach about it all the time, about the awakened season that we're in. From 19, in 1970, there were 57 million spirit-empowered believers, believers that believed in deliverance, prophecy, healing. The power of God moved through them. There were 57 million spirit-empowered believers on the earth that, that identified as that. Today, there are 644 million. The church has shrunk but spirit-empowered believers have more than tenfolded. He says the reason why you're seeing it is because there's people that can do something about it. 
So because there are spirit-empowered believers and there are spirits in the room that need to be unempowered, that's why you're seeing a manifestation all the time. When you, It was happening before, but those people walked in no authority or power to do anything about it. And now we have an increase, and at the same time, we have an increase of the power of the church, and so there's an increase in the display of the demonic. That's why it's happening right now. Because believers are increasing in authority. So it has to happen. So it turns out we do have them. We just didn't know how to detect them. We didn't have the spiritual technology. But now we can detect them. And so I want you to catch this. In seasons like this, when we walk into seasons, as our nation, as you turn to the news, this is one of the reasons that I, that I, I tell people, like, please, please don't just sit around watching the news all day. You know what will happen? You know what happens to you when you watch the news all day? You either get afraid or you get angry. Tell, tell me, anybody watch the news all the time and you're just happy, go lucky, and full of joy and peace? Anybody? Anybody watch all the news cycle? Like, I'm not saying be disinformed. I'm obviously talking about how I'm involved in political spheres right now. And so I am telling you this from a place of not being unplugged. I'm telling you, understand, know, know what's going on, know how to pray, but do not be surrounded by things that make you afraid or angry. If you find yourself getting afraid or angry, you have allowed a thought to run rampant in your mind, and the enemy doesn't care that the information you're getting is good. It doesn't, he doesn't care. He will use righteous anger to just turn it into plain old anger, when it's obsessed on in order to grab hold of you. And you think, you're like, but yeah, but I'm right. It doesn't matter if you're right. Right is not righteous. Rightness doesn't equal righteousness. And so we have to be careful not to give ourselves into it. So there has to be a balance where the kingdom of God always comes first. Otherwise, we will always open ourselves up to fear and anger. And when fear and anger grab you, the, the demonic forces of hell can grab a hold of you. And I'm not saying that just because you're angry once or fearful once that all of a sudden you are demonized. But it does allow the enemy to come in and rob you. Here's the truth is that the enemy is not the thief you've been told he is. John 10, 10, but the thief comes to still kill and destroy. Back up to John 9, it will explain to you, he's talking about the Pharisees that try to get to heaven and, and avoid Jesus as the door. They sneak in another way. They're thieves and robbers. They come in and they don't go through him. And so he calls them thieves. There is nowhere in scripture that calls the enemy a thief. Did you know that? There is nowhere in scripture. That's the only place and it's misinterpreted. It's for the Pharisees. Am I suggesting the enemy doesn't take from you? Absolutely not. He's not a thief. He's a king of this world. Kings aren't thieves. They're plunderers. They're invaders. When a thief comes into your territory to take from you, he is engaging in warfare. It's war, not thievery. So we want to picture the enemy as some little burglar sneaking around taking things from you. He doesn't have the right. He has to have access to you. He has to, in scripture, you look and he, he has to, Jesus says, the, the, uh, Satan has asked for you to sift you, but I have prayed for you. He had to ask permission to have access to Peter. He had to ask permission to get at Job. He has to have legal authority to come in and take those things. So when we walk into fear and anger, what he says is, uh, they left the door open for me. I can come in and take whatever I want now because they've opened a door that I am allowed to now enter and take. I can't come through a locked door, but I'm allowed to come in a door where they open up and say, oh, come on in. Thank you. I think I'll take your TV. I think I'll take your valuables. I'll take what I want because you have invited me in. And so we have to be careful not to, we have to take our thoughts captive, not give them a dinner invitation. We have to take them that. So it's more important in seasons like this where we're prone to look around, especially as our church is being kind of involved in this, and go, ah, ah, and, and watch the, the way we love instead of how much we hate what we see. We hate what's happening in our government. We hate what's happening in our world. We hate watching sin take over. We hate watching the enemy advance. I love watching people get free. I love seeing God touch lives. I love seeing God advance in the nation. I love the people of our country. Therefore, I stand up for godly leaders. 
I love them. I am not motivated by hate. I am not motivated by being afraid. We got to do something or else we're going to lose. We have to stop being motivated by fear and hate. So when you start getting riled up, you start getting upset. Stop for a second and go, am I coming from a place of love or am I coming from a place of fear? We want to pray for you. Send us a message with your prayer requests through Facebook or email and let us know how we can pray for you today. Also, let us know how this message impacted your life. I love you. God loves you. Shalom. Shalom.